gracias, gracias a Bona Tarda y os siento mol, yo no parlo catalá. Eso es todo. Uh, gracias. So, <laughs> so this, is a, this is an important evening for me, and I am so excited to see so many of you here today, so many people out tonight. Thank you for coming out and choosing to be a part of this very important conversation. Uh, this is my first time ever in Barcelona, and um, it is also, um, I have been giving this presentation for three years now um, on an international speaking tour, and this is the last talk of 2013, which was the most important year of all for me. So this is an important night for me, and I'm very happy that tonight I am standing here. So thank you. Um, did you have a chance to see some of these images that were showing before the images of, yeah, that I had up earlier? Aren't they lovely? You know, whenever I begin this presentation, I always like to um, start out by explaining that when I make new slides, it always takes me so long to find just the right images that really convey the essence of what I'm trying to communicate but not when it comes to images depicting the natural connection so many of us have with animals, and especially the connection children have with animals. I always find way more than I can use. I mean, there are literally thousands of pictures out there that really capture that childlike sense of wonder, that understanding, that caring. So because I'll be referring to this human-animal connection throughout this presentation, I want to do a brief exercise with you to explore it a bit more fully. I'd like you to try to think of one or more animals in your life who you have felt a connection to. So maybe it was the horse you took riding lessons on or the guinea pig in your next-door next neighbor's yard. Maybe it was the dog you grew up with or a hurt bird you rescued, or maybe it was a fish or a turtle. Now I want to take a poll. Raise your hand if you were able to think of at least one animal. Okay, that was very easy. More than one animal. That was easy too. Okay, so raise your hand if you have ever felt cared about or loved by an animal. Okay, that's a whole lot of love. And our experience tells us something important. We care about animals. We feel connected to them. We can see examples of this everywhere. We teach our children to be kind to animals, not to harm them. We make animals the heroes of our children's stories and the stars of their shows. When we're walking in the woods and we catch a glimpse of a deer through the trees, or when we see dolphins leaping out of the ocean, or when we notice a delicate butterfly rest resting on a flower, we often feel that sense of awe that makes us just stop and speak in hushed voices and watch with what some might even call reverence. When we hear of an abused or mistreated animal, we recognize the injustice and we feel outraged. When we're at the petting zoo and the piglet chooses our hand to eat out of, we feel special. We get excited. Can you relate to some of these feelings? I mean, I certainly can too. So before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about me and my story and how I came to be here today. This is a picture of me and my dog Fritz a long time ago. Um, Fritz was my first dog, but he was also my first friend. We did, my mother tells me we adopted Fritz when he was about two months old and I was about two years old. So we were really just babies when we first met. And we, we did everything together. We played together, we napped together, and we even vomited together once during a sickening summer road trip. It's really true. And Fritz was also my first heartbreak when he died at the age of 13 of liver cancer. 
And what I didn't realize back then was that Fritz would, or more accurately, my connection with Fritz would be the catalyst for my life's work. And that's what brings me here today. My life's work as a psychologist, an author, and a professor has centered around one key theme. It's a theme that is central to our freedom of choice and therefore to our personal empowerment and also to so social and ecological justice. And that theme is making the connection. I'm here to talk about our connection with other beings, and with ourselves, and with our core values, and about the invisible belief system, the ism, that disconnects us from these fundamental aspects of our lives. I'm here to talk about how this ism creates a disconnect when it comes, a, a gap in our consciousness, when it comes to some of the most frequent and important choices we make our food choices, and how this gap causes us to act against our own interests and the interests of others. So I'm here with the goal, which is to raise awareness of this invisible-ism to promote personal empowerment and social and ecological justice. Now, I'm going to talk for about one hour, and this presentation will be in three parts. First, we will talk about the problem of the gap. Next, we will talk about the causes of the gap and also the consequences of our food choices on ourselves and our world. And finally, because everybody likes a happy ending, I like a happy ending, we will talk about the solution to the gap. Okay, let's get started. What is this gap I've been talking about? Now, to help illustrate this concept, I want to do an exercise with you. I'd like you to imagine that you are the guest at a dinner party and your host is famous for her homemade pasta and meatballs, and she serves you a dish that looks like this. Now, consider whether you would find this delicious or disgusting. For those of you who would find it delicious, let's imagine that you find it so delicious that you ask your host for her recipe. And flattered, she replies, well, the secret is in the meat. You need to start out with three pounds of well-marinated, golden retriever. Okay, now take a moment to reflect on your thoughts and feelings. I mean, chances are what you thought of just moments ago as food, you now think of as a dead animal. What you just felt was delicious, you now feel is disgusting. Chances are your experience of the meat dramatically changed, even though nothing about the meat itself actually changed. So what is it then that changed? Well, what changed was your perception of the meat. Now, our perception is the lens that we look at the world through. And when it comes to eating animals, our perception is shaped largely, if not entirely, by our culture. In meat-eating cultures around the world, people tend to have a tiny handful of animals out of thousands of possible species that they learn to classify as edible. All the rest we classify as inedible and disgusting. And so even though the type of species consumed changes from culture to culture, members of all cultures tend to find their own choices to be rational and the choices of other cultures to be irrational and disgusting and often even offensive. So What's striking is not the presence of disgust. Disgust is the norm, it's the rule rather than the exception. What's striking is the absence of disgust. Why are we not disgusted by the, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 if you're an adventurous eater? Species that we have taught to think of, as, uh, we've been taught to think of as edible. And perhaps even more importantly, why don't we ever ask why? 
Have you ever wondered why you might eat chicken's wings, but not swan's wings? Leg of lamb, but not leg of kitten? They both come from baby animals. Have you ever wondered why you might eat beef stew, but not guinea pig stew? Fish soup, but not lizard soup. Hen's eggs, but not pigeon's eggs. Are you getting hungry? I thought so. I can tell looking at you. Have you ever wondered why you might drink cow's milk, but not pig's milk? And have you ever wondered why you haven't wondered? When it comes to edible animals, there is a disconnect. There is a gap in our perceptual process. There's a gap in our consciousness. We don't make the conscious connection between the meat on our plate and the living being it once was. When I was growing up, I was the picky eater in my family. And in my house, we had a rule that nobody could leave the table until their plate was clean. And so, not surprisingly, this often led to some late night standoffs between me and my mother. Because my mother would try not to let me out of her sight. And I would wait for just the right moment when she wasn't looking to slip my food to Fritz, my partner in crime under the table. And if my mother happened to catch me, I would tell her I was just petting the dog. And she would believe me because there were plenty of times when I really was just petting the dog. And over the course of so many years and so many meals, I never thought about how strange it was that I could be petting my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other. A pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and sensitive and conscious as my dog. I never thought about the inconsistencies in my attitudes and behaviors toward these animals because, to be honest, when I was eating the pork chop, I didn't actually think I was eating an animal. I mean, sure, I knew on some level that whenever I ate meat, someone had to die for my plate, but on another level, I just didn't connect the dots. I just, I had that knowing without knowing. I had a gap in my consciousness. And so, because this gap in our consciousness blocks our awareness of the reality of our meat, it also blocks our authentic thoughts and feelings about our meat. Remember when I told you that you were eating a golden retriever, chances are you couldn't help but think of the living animal and feel disgusted. And yet, when you believed you were eating the flesh of a cow, chances are you had no thoughts of the living animal and you felt no disgust. And so, when we are not aware of the reality of our meat or of our authentic thoughts and feelings about our meat, then we are also not aware that we have a choice, that we are making a choice every time we eat meat. And so this gap in our consciousness robs us of our ability to make our choices freely. Because without awareness, there is no free choice. For much of my life, I never questioned my choice to eat pigs and chickens and cows and fish because I never even thought I had a choice. No one had ever asked me if I wanted to eat animals, how I felt about eating animals, if I believed in eating animals. No one had ever encouraged me to reflect upon this daily practice that had such profound ethical dimensions and personal implications. Eating animals was just a given. It was just the way things are. 
It is really striking that we learn from our culture to spend more time thinking about what brand of shampoo to buy than about what species of animals we eat and why, when our food choices have such a significant impact on our bodies and our minds, and of course, also on our world. So now that we've talked a little bit about what this gap is, we can turn our attention to the next set of questions, which are where does it come from and what are its consequences? It was half a lifetime before I started asking these questions. It was 1989 and I had recently awoken to find myself hooked up to intravenous antibiotics at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston after having eaten what turned out to be my very last hamburger. According to my team of doctors, um, Beth Israel is a, a teaching hospital, so to my humiliation, I was assigned a group of young, good-looking interns who were fascinated by my intestinal activity, and I will say nothing else about this. And according to the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts, I had eaten a hamburger that was contaminated with Campylobacter, uh, a foodborne bacteria similar to Salmonella. You may know Salmonella? Yes. Yeah, Cam Campylobacter. So for Campy Campylobacter is like, just imagine the worst gastrointestinal flu you've ever had times 10. That's what Campylobacter felt like to me anyway. So contracting Campylobacter was one of the worst experiences of my life. But it was also one of the best experiences of my life. It was a turning point for me. Before I got sick, I had been increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of eating meat, having witnessed on a handful of occasions information about the horrors of animal agriculture. I mean, I knew on some level that eating animals was antithetical to my personal values. Like most people, I cared about animals and I, I didn't want them to suffer, especially when that suffering was so intensive and so completely unnecessary. And yet, I hadn't been ready to take that information in, so my response was always, don't tell me that, you'll ruin my meal. But after I got sick, I never wanted to eat another hamburger or any meat again. And so I didn't. And then, something interesting happened to me. When I stopped eating animals, I made the connection. I had a, a shift of consciousness, a, a paradigm shift. In other words, I didn't see different things. I saw the same things differently. Remember how different your meat looked to you when you thought it was a golden retriever? Well, that's how all meat suddenly looked to me. It's just, it's interesting how the gaps in our consciousness only become visible when they start to disappear. And as the gap in my consciousness closed, my mind opened. I wanted to learn the truth about animal agriculture. It was a truth that had been right in front of me. It had been all around me, but that I had been unable or really unwilling to see. And I, I wanted, I needed to understand how, when it came to eating animals, rational, caring people, just like myself, could just stop thinking. So I spent about 20 years looking for answers, including about a decade of research that culminated in my doctoral dissertation on the psychology of eating meat. And what I found was to dramatically change the way that I and some others working in psychology and social justice thought about the issue of eating animals. So to, to share my findings with you, I want to begin with an exercise. If vegetarian is the term we use to describe an individual who follows the belief system that we call vegetarianism, 
And vegan is the term we use to describe an individual who follows the belief system we call veganism. What then do we call somebody who is not a vegetarian or vegan? What you can shout it out. What do you say? Yeah, okay, so omnivore, right? It's probably the most common term. Um, carnivore, and one more. Yeah, exactly, meat eater. These are probably the most common terms, right? So let's look at these terms, though. An omnivore, by definition, is an animal, human or non-human, who can ingest both flesh and plant matter, right? And a carnivore is an animal who needs to ingest flesh in order to survive. So both omnivore and carnivore describe one's biological predisposition, not one's philosophical or ideological choice. And meat eater describes a behavior as though it's divorced from a belief system. I mean, this is why we don't call vegans plant eaters, because we recognize that the behavior of eating plants reflects a, a deeper belief system or ideology. And by the way, vegan is a pure vegetarian for those of you who are not familiar with the term. We tend to assume that it's only vegans and vegetarians who bring their beliefs to the dinner table. But most of us don't learn to eat pigs but not dogs, for example, because we don't have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. When eating animals is not a necessity for survival, which is the case in much of the world today, then it is a choice, and choices always stem from beliefs. So what I found is that there is an invisible belief system that conditions us to eat certain animals. And this is the belief system I came to call carnism. Now, carnism is a special kind of belief system or ideology. It is a dominant ideology. That means it's invisible, entrenched, it shapes beliefs, behaviors, norms, laws, etc. And it is also a violent ideology. Meat cannot be procured without violence. And eggs and dairy cannot be procured without harming animals. And today, the egg and dairy industry are arguably the most brutal of all carnistic industries. And dominant violent ideologies, such as carnism, need to use a set of social and psychological defense mechanisms to enable humane people to participate in inhumane practices without fully realizing what they are doing. In other words, carnism teaches us how not to feel. Now, the primary defense of the system is denial. If we deny there's a problem in the first place, then we don't have to do anything about it. And denial is expressed largely through invisibility. Now, one way carnism remains invisible is by remaining unnamed. If we don't name it, we can't even think about it, so we can't question it. Carnism also remains invisible by keeping its victims out of sight and therefore conveniently out of public consciousness. Now, carnism is an entire system of victimization. It victimizes all of us in different ways. But before I talk about the invisible victims of carnism, I want to do an exercise with you to demonstrate the power and scope of invisibility. Okay, this is a fill in the blank. So what do you think? 124,000 farmed animals are killed globally every what? Month? This, uh, this applies only to land animals, by the way. If we included fish in aquatic life, other aquatic life, this number could be possibly quintupled. Every week, every day, okay, some people are saying day, some people say week, every hour, 
hour, okay, every minute. There's no room for a second. That's where the source is going. If you guessed minute, you guessed correctly. That adds up to about 65 billion animals per year. So in the time it took us to do this exercise, 124,000 animals were just slaughtered. But think about it. How many farmed animals have you seen? Really think about it. How many have you seen this week? How many have you seen this month? Or this year, 65 billion this year. How many of them have you seen in your lifetime? So where are they? I mean, given that these animals' body parts are literally everywhere we turn, why don't we ever see them alive? We don't see the animals whose bodies become our food because we're not supposed to. They are not, as carnistic industry would have us believe, living on happy little farms. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm sorry. I have to explain this. When I selected this slide, it said happy cow. But I have learned from audiences that it's more like a creepy cow. <laughs> like a clown. It's supposed to make you laugh, but it scares you a little bit, right? Sorry. Approximately 95% of the meat, eggs, and dairy that make it to our plates comes from animals who were raised on factory farms. They're windowless sheds in remote locations that are virtually impossible for anyone other than industry officials to obtain access to. And if you did try to obtain access to one of these compounds, you could wind up in prison thanks to a number of new pieces of legislation that are being enacted in countries around the world as people become increasingly concerned with the, the issue of animal agriculture. For example, in the United States, our most famous or notorious piece of le legislation is called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. According to Dara Lovitz, um, attorney and author of the book Muzzling a Movement, the AETA states that one has committed the federal crime of terrorism if they engage in any activity that may reduce the profits of an animal enterprise. So just who are these individuals that carnistic industry works so hard to hide from us? I'm, I'm going to show you a short video um, that's narrated by Dr. Jonathan Balcom. He's an animal behaviorist and the author of over 40 scientific papers and four books on animal cognition that offers a, a rare glimpse into their inner lives. Pigs are curious, playful, and at least as intelligent as dogs. I often kneel down next to one of the pigs, maybe Peapod or Petunia, lazing in the thick hay of their barn. I scratch their heads and rub their bellies. Most pigs will make an effort to reposition themselves to expose more of their belly for scratching and rubbing. This simple act says, that feels good. Chickens and turkeys are social birds with a vocabulary of distinctive calls and the ability to recognize other individuals in their flock by their appearance and their voice. Chickens and turkeys also show virtuous behavior. For example, both species use alarm calls to signal the approach of a dangerous predator. Whoever sounds the alarm draws attention to him or herself, but they bravely do it for the flock. A rooster will often call a hen and offer her food either by pointing to it on the ground or by offering it in his beak. Well-nurtured calves are happy and confident, and their mothers go to great lengths to ensure their care. For instance, veterinarian Holly Cheever was once called out to a dairy when a cow mysteriously stopped producing milk. The cow had recently delivered her fifth baby out in the pasture, and as usual her calf was taken away from her as soon as she led the calf back to the milking barn. Normally, a milked cow produces over 12 gallons per day, but this cow returned from the pasture every evening with an empty udder. 
Eleven days later, it was discovered she had produced twins. Having lost four previous babies, the mother cow had made a painful choice to allow one of her children to be taken so she could hide the other in the woods. Fishes are grossly misunderstood. Careful scientific studies show that they experience pain, that they recognize other individuals, and they have preferred mates. Lobsters and crabs show responses to painful stimuli that indicate the experience of pain. This information has convinced some regions to enact anti-cruelty laws banning the practice of boiling lobsters alive. There is no longer any reasonable doubt that animals think and feel, and that they have rich emotional and social lives. Yeah, I know. Uh, some of those scenes were really lovely, I know. Um, farm Sanctuary, which is the um, leading farmed animal protection organization in the United States, is unfortunately, and there are farm sanctuaries all around the world, um, these sanctuaries are unfortunately home to only a tiny minority of farmed animals. Um, and so in a moment, I'm going to show you another very short video that offers a glimpse into the lives of the ma majority. But before I do, I want to just give you a quick heads up. The video I'm going to show is undercover footage in animal factories, and it can be distressing to witness. So I want to remind you that my goal here today is not to distress you. It's to raise awareness. And to do that, I have got to make the invisible visible. I have spent a lot of time selecting material that I felt was sufficient to inform you without actually traumatizing you. So I encourage you to witness this video because I believe that the empowerment that awareness ultimately brings is well worth the discomfort. And this is feedback that I have gotten from thousands of people over the years. But I also want to encourage you to pay attention to yourself. For some of you, you have seen this before. You do not need to see it again. For some of you, maybe it's just too difficult to watch. So just close your eyes, plug your ears, and I will keep the sound low enough so you can block most of it out if you want to. It's just about four minutes long. Mother sows are locked in narrow metal stalls barely larger than their own bodies. Soon after birth, piglets are castrated by workers who cut into their skin and rip out their testicles. Next, the workers chop off their tails. Both of these painful procedures are nearly always done without anesthesia. Others are killed by being slammed headfirst into the ground. Once pigs have reached market weight, they are sent to slaughter. At the slaughterhouse, pigs are knocked in the head with a steel rod, hung upside down, and have their throats slit. Improper stunning condemns many pigs to having their throats slit while they are fully conscious and suffering. Because male chicks don't lay eggs and do not grow quickly enough to be raised profitably for meat, they are killed within hours after hatching. Male chicks are typically thrown into giant grinding machines while still alive. This practice is deemed standard and acceptable by the egg industry. The females have it even worse, destined for a life of prolonged cruelty. To reduce pecking induced by overcrowded living conditions, workers use a hot blade or laser to remove part of the chick's beaks. After debeaking, the birds are moved to cages where they will spend the rest of their lives. Nearly 95% of egg-laying hens spend their lives confined in tiny wire cages like this. Through genetic selection, chickens and turkeys raised for meat have been bred to grow so large so quickly that many suffer crippling leg disorders, chronic joint pain, and even fatal heart attacks. Those who live to reach market weight are thrown into transport crates and loaded onto trucks bound for slaughter plants. At the slaughter plant, the birds are dumped from their crates, then roughly snapped upside down into moving shackles by their fragile legs. They are then pulled across a blade which slices their throats, causing blood to pour from their necks. 
Calves on dairy farms are dragged away from their mothers and violently killed, all so that humans can have the milk instead. The majority of today's dairy cows are confined on factory farms. Workers subject young cows to painful mutilations and amputations. At a fraction of their natural lifespan, the so-called spent dairy cows are prodded onto transport trucks and shipped to slaughterhouses. Unreliable stunning practices at the slaughterhouse condemn many cattle to having their throats cut and their limbs hacked off while still alive and conscious. Undercover investigations at kosher slaughterhouses in the United States have documented the routine practice of cutting open the throats of fully aware and alert cattle. Massive trawling nets indiscriminately drag hundreds of tons of fish and other animals along the ocean floor. They are then tossed on board where the surviving fish either suffocate or are crushed to death. Others are still alive when they are hacked apart on these floating slaughterhouses. Like factory farmed animals on land, farm raised fish are crowded by the tens of thousands in small disease and excrement ridden areas for their entire lives. When fish reach market weight, they are loaded onto tanker trucks and shipped to slaughter, where common killing methods include slow suffocation. Thank you. Thank you for bearing witness to this. I, I know it's not easy. It never gets easy for me. People always tell me that this four minutes out of one hour long presentation feels like the longest part of the whole presentation. So thank you. Before we move on, I want to point out that much of what you've seen here are standard industry practices that apply to so-called um, humane or organic bio meat facilities as well. You know, whenever people see the truth about animal agriculture, they always ask me, you know, Melanie, how is this legal? And I always answer that not only is this legal, there is an entire industrial complex built around this kind of violence and slaughter. Animal agribusiness is big money. In the United States alone, it's a $125 billion industry. There are countless companies like this one selling a castrator and emasculator as though it were a nail clipper. You could even buy one on eBay if you wanted to, believe it or not. So clearly the animals pay dearly for our carnism. But as I mentioned, animals are not the only invisible victims of the system. Another group of invisible victims are the meat packers and slaughterhouse workers who have to work in a highly dangerous, death-saturated environment and not surprisingly have been found to have high rates of post-traumatic stress and addictions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this issue, just one slide, but just to give you a sense of this industry, I'm going to share with you that in 2005, for the first time ever, Human Rights Watch issued a report criticizing a single U.S. industry the meat industry, for working conditions so appalling they violate basic human rights. And our environment is an invisible victim of carnism. For example, The United Nations states that animal agriculture is one of the most significant contributors to the most serious environmental problems facing the world today. A 
and greenhouse gas emissions caused by livestock exceed that of all forms of transportation combined. And we are the invisible victims of our carnism. We pay for our carnism with our health as eating animal foods has been linked with some of the most widespread and serious diseases in the Western world. Everything from obesity to cancer to heart disease and diabetes. In the past five to ten years in the United States and in Germany and in some other places in the world, there has been a raising awareness among medical practitioners of the dangers of eating animal foods. For example, the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Cardiology, perhaps the most prestigious journal of cardiology in the entire world, says that the the best way to prevent heart disease is to not eat meat. And the chair of nutrition at the Harvard University School of Public Health says that we now know that replacing red meat protein with plant protein lowers your risk of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. There is a growing awareness of the superiority of plant protein for the human body. And the Jocelyn Diabetes Center, which is a famous center for diabetes treatment, says that studies show that following a pure vegetarian, a vegan diet can help with lowering your risk of heart disease and also treating and preventing diabetes. So we pay for our carnism with our health. But we also pay for our carnism with our hearts and with our minds. Because to eat the body of another sentient being, we have to block our awareness and shut down our empathy. We pay for our carnism with the gap in our consciousness. Okay, now I have spent a long time talking about invisibility, the main defense of the system. But do you believe that invisibility alone is enough to maintain the entire system? No, I mean, of course not. Hints of the truth surround us. The resistant dr vein in the chicken drumstick. The hog on a spit at a barbecue vegan guests at dinner parties, and an endless array of dead animals everywhere we turn in the form of meat. So when invisibility inevitably falters, we need to be able to justify eating animals. And the way that we learn to justify eating animals is by learning to believe that the myths of meat, eggs, and dairy are the facts of meat, eggs, and dairy. Now, there is a vast mythology surrounding eating animals, but all myths fall under what I refer to as the three ends of justification. Eating animals is, what do you think? You're fast. Normal, natural, and necessary. Yes. And it's so interesting to me because I do this exercise with audiences all around the world. People always guess this eventually. Why do you think everybody knows the answer? Yeah, we've heard this all before. Right? These same arguments have been used to justify violent ideologies throughout the course of human history.
So let's briefly look at each of these myths in turn. Eating animals is normal. Well, what we call normal is really just the beliefs and behaviors of the dominant culture. It is the carnistic norm. For example, I'd like you to imagine that you are back at that dinner party where your host has just told you that you are eating a golden retriever. Sorry, this is the last time, I promise. But now imagine that you tell your host how you feel. And she replies by telling you Don, not to worry, not to feel bad, because the dog had a good life. She was able to run and play, and she even formed friendships with other golden retrievers and some people before she was killed at six months old. Does she taste any better now? In some ways, she probably tastes even worse because she had a life she wanted to continue living. So ask yourself if you would be opposed to a happy, healthy golden retriever being killed simply because people like the way her thighs taste. Why might you not be opposed to the exact same thing being done to somebody else? Carnism as a social norm is so entrenched that it blinds us to the fact that humane or organic meat is a complete contradiction in terms. Organic meat is a myth. It is a myth constructed by those in the business of violence to appeal to those of us who would ordinarily never support such violence. Eating animals is natural. Well, what we call natural is really just the dominant culture's interpretation of history. It refers not to human history, but to carnistic history. It references not our fruit-eating ancestors, but rather their flesh-eating descendants. In other words, we only look as far back in history as we need to, to justify current carnistic practices. And to be fair, murder and rape are arguably as long-standing and therefore as natural as eating animals. And yet we don't invoke the longevity of these practices as a justification for them today. And finally, eating animals is necessary. Well, what we call necessary is simply what is necessary to maintain the dominant culture, to maintain the carnistic status quo. And here I'm going to let a picture speak for itself. Now, often people um, think that one of the ends of um, eating animals uh, is necessary, is, is necessary for nutrition. This is often expressed through the protein myth. This myth is very powerful and has been around for a very long time, and it's only in the past decade, and really the past five years, that, that medical practitioners, nutritionists, have realized that it is a complete myth. In fact, did you know that you could be strong enough to lift a car without having eaten an ounce of animal protein in your entire life? Really? And today there are more and more athletes um, who are becoming vegan not 
simply for animal ethics, for, for ethical reasons, but to improve their athletic performance. There's been some very interesting new books and DVDs coming out that are written by and about um, star athletes and vegan diets. Some of you might know Germany's strongest man who is a vegan. He is a strong man. Looking back on my own resistance to witnessing the truth about eating animals, I could see how the myths had a, a tremendous influence on me, as they do on all of us. Now, I couldn't close that gap in my consciousness until I was ready to make the behavioral change that would inevitably follow. And I couldn't make that change until I felt safe enough to do so. And I had a lot of fears and concerns. Would I get sick? Would I go broke buying expensive vegan foods? Would I have to subsist on a diet of tofu and cardboard? And what about my relationships? My father was, he is today, a professional fisherman. My uncle has been an avid hunter his entire life. My Jewish stepmother made the best matzo ball soup, chicken matzo ball soup, this side of the equator. My Italian Nana loved to stuff us full of her lasagna marinara. And my half Lebanese mother served an Arabic lamb dish as the centerpiece for every special occasion. So, what would happen if I rejected the traditions that bonded me to my family? Now, what I didn't realize back then was that although change is always somewhat scary, and changing ingrained behaviors is always somewhat challenging, this kind of change would be tremendously empowering. And I didn't realize that many of my fears were unfounded that I would be healthier today at 47 years old than I was when I was half my age. Or that I would be able to cook and eat even more abundantly. And I didn't realize that the deepest bonds with others are created not by unquestioningly following traditions, but by becoming the kind of person who practices authenticity and integrity the cornerstones of meaningful relationships. John F. Kennedy once said that belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. JFK did not underestimate the power of myths, and neither should we, because the myths of meat prevail despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And they prevail largely because the system is institutionalized. And when we are born into an institutionalized system such as carnism, we inevitably absorb that system's logic as our own. In other words, we internalize carnism. We learn to look at the world through the lens of carnism. And carnism uses a set of defenses that distort our perceptions of meat, eggs, dairy, and the animals that we eat so that we can feel comfortable enough to consume them. For example, carnism teaches us to see animals as objects. So we learn to refer to this chicken as something rather than someone. Or to call this little baby an it, a thing, rather than he or she. Carnism teaches us to see animals as abstractions, as lacking in any individuality or personality of their own. A pig is a pig, and all pigs are the same. And as with other victims of violent ideologies, we give them numbers rather than names. 
A meat cutter I interviewed for my dissertation said this to me. I don't think of farmed animals as individuals. I wouldn't be able to do my job if I got that personal with them. When you say individuals, you mean as a unique person, as a unique thing with its own name and its own characteristics, its own little games that it plays? Yeah? Yeah, I'd really rather not know that. I'm sure it has it, but I'd rather not know it. And carnism teaches us to place animals in rigid categories in our minds so that we can harbor very different feelings and carry out very different behaviors toward different species. For example, a meat eater I interviewed for my dissertation told me that she regularly consumes a variety of types of, of meats. And then when I asked her if she ate veal, she got very quiet and looked at me with a shocked expression on her face. And when she finally answered, this is what she said. Let's just say I came to your house and you told me that I had just eaten veal. I'd probably vomit, like I have to get that out of my system. And when I asked her why, she said, because veal comes from a baby. I can't eat a baby. When we look at the world through the lens of carnism, we fail to see the absurdities of the system. So we see images like this, or like this, someone mutilating their own body to be eaten. And we take no notice rather than take offense. Or we see images like this, or like this, and we laugh rather than cry. Voltaire was right. If we believe absurdities, we shall commit atrocities. And carnism is but one of the many atrocities, one of the many violent ideologies that are an unfortunate part of the human legacy. And although the experience of each set of victims will always be somewhat unique, the ideologies themselves are structurally similar. The mentality that enables the violence is the same. It is the mentality of domination and subjugation, of privilege and oppression. It's the mentality that causes us to turn someone into something, to reduce a life to a unit of production, to erase someone's being. It is the might makes right mentality that makes us feel entitled to wield complete control over the lives and deaths of those with less power just because we can. And to feel justified in our actions because they're only savages, women, animals. It is the mentality of meat. And so, if we fail to pick out the common threads that are woven through all violent ideologies, then we will simply recreate atrocities in new forms. This is why it is so important that we include all oppressive systems into our analysis, including carnism. Because eating animals is not simply a matter of personal ethics. It is the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched oppressive ism. Eating animals is a social justice issue. Martin Luther King understood the ways in which oppressive systems reinforce one another. He wisely cautioned that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere.
And the opposite is also true. Justice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. And justice is not an abstract concept. Justice is a practice. It's a practice that can be carried out anywhere. On the streets of the nation's capital, in a courtroom, in a museum. And of course, we can also practice justice on our plates. So this brings us to the conclusion. Knowing what we know about the problem that is carnism, what do we do about it? What is the solution to the gap? Well, I'd like to address this question with another question for you. What do you think is the reason that we use carnistic defenses in the first place? You can just say it if you want. Does anybody want to guess? Yes. Yeah, well, it's, it is convenient. I mean, social norms make it easy to, to, to eat animals, that's for sure. Yes, that's right. Because people, exactly, because we care. We care about animals, we care about justice, and we care about the truth. And carnism depends on our not caring, and the entire system is built on deception. I have been talking about the issue of animal agriculture for about 20 years now, and I almost never encounter a person who doesn't cringe when faced with images of animals suffering. So the good news is that carnism is a house of carts. It is a vulnerable system that needs a strong fortress to protect itself from its very own proponents, us. Why else would we need to go through all the psychological acrobatics if not because we care? So our caring is both the problem and the solution. Our caring is what makes us want to turn away from the truth. But our caring is also what gives us the courage to face the truth. The courage to bear witness. When we bear witness, this means that we are willing to see the truth with our eyes and minds and also with our hearts. When we bear witness, we identify with another. We see something of ourselves in them and something of them in ourselves, even if the only thing we identify with is the desire not to suffer. When we bear witness, we empathize with another. We look at the world through their eyes so that when we make choices that impact them, we ask ourselves, what would he or she ask me to do? When we bear witness, we make the connection. We close the gap in our consciousness and we become more empowered because we become more integrated. We're more in alignment with our core values. Values such as compassion, justice, and reciprocity, the, the golden rule. Values that are diametrically opposed to carnism. And we therefore can practice greater integrity in our personal lives. Integrity is the integration of values and practices. And witnessing can take so many forms. Just think about the fall of the Berlin Wall, the demonstrations in Tahrir Square, the revolutionary music of the 1960s. Witnessing can be writing or not writing a check in the name of justice. It can be standing on a street corner handing out pamphlets. It can be holding a demonstration. Witnessing can be hosting or presenting or attending a slideshow. Y 
if you think about it, throughout the history of humankind, virtually every atrocity was made possible because the populace turned away from a reality that they felt was too painful to face. And virtually every revolution, every social transformation was made possible because a group of people chose to bear witness and they demanded that others bear witness as well. For instance, just consider the countless witnesses, the conscientious objectors throughout history. Some who have been famous, but most who have been the unsung heroes of social transformation. This transformative potential of witnessing is why oppressive systems such as carnism need to deny the truth about the social movements that challenge them. They need to minimize the true power and scope of these movements. So despite what mainstream carnistic culture would like us to believe, there is in fact reason to be very, very hopeful. And that is because the vegan movement, which is the counterpoint to carnism, is in fact thriving. It is growing and mushrooming in countries all around the world, and especially in the past five years, and it's pretty incredible to see what's happening. So, for example, in the United States, the number of vegans and vegetarians doubled in three years. This is a trend that is happening in many places now, including here, the number is growing. More and more leaders and celebrities are saying no to carnism. Ellen DeGeneres has her own website. You know Ellen here, right? She has her own website dedicated entirely to going vegan. Um, vegan cookbooks and innovative foods and restaurants and chefs are just popping up everywhere. It's just, it's incredible to see the explosion of veganism. So really, moving beyond veganism, it enables us to step into a vibrant community of millions of people and to become a part of something that's greater than our individual selves. So coming full circle, back to the 1970s, actually, no, this was 1980 when I painted this picture. Um, Fritz, as you may recall, who was my first dog, um, was in many ways also my first teacher. Fritz taught me that love, which is the highest form of connection and the highest expression of justice, should not be limited by arbitrary boundaries such as species. To love someone is to respect their being. It's to respect that no matter how different from us they are, they have a life that matters to them. So Fritz taught me to be a witness. He taught me that love is a verb. And this is why the goal of my presentation tonight and the goal of my life's work really has been to raise awareness of the violent system that is carnism. Because for better or worse, we are all participants in this system. So our choice is not whether we participate, but how we participate. And with awareness, we can choose to be active witnesses rather than passive bystanders. With awareness, we can lead more authentic and freely chosen lives. And then we can truly become, as, as Gandhi said, the change that we wish to see. Gracias. Thank you.